Well, okay, welcome to the latest and greatest, hottest seminar. Um, today we have Evan Cavallo, who will be talking about why some cubicle models don't present spaces and uh, jo joint work with Christian Sattler. Please go ahead. All right, uh, so it is as you say. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about some cubicle models that aren't spaces and uh, why they aren't. Um, so let me try and start with some background. Um, about the relationship in the study of homotopy type theory between, on the one hand, interest in constructivity, and on the other hand, interest in homotopy theory. So uh, we've probably said or heard someone say, it's not a quote from anyone, but uh, I can say it now, hot is a constructive language uh, for homotopy theory. There, quote from me. Um, and so if we are looking at that for homotopy theory side, we might be thinking about um, way back in the early days that uh, you can interpret homotopy type theory in simplicial sets and simplicial sets are a setting for a standard homotopy theory. And uh, more recently nowadays, um, you could think, oh, I can interpret not only in simplicial sets, but I can interpret in any uh, infinity topos I like, um, thanks to the work of Mike Schulman. Um, on the other hand, if I'm thinking about constructivity, I might be thinking not about those interpretations, but about the constructive interpretations, um, which I guess came in between the first and second bullet point up here on the homotopy theory side. Um, so on the one hand, we have constructive interpretations in cubicle settings, and I'll be talking about cubicle setting, settings later. I mean, in the whole talk, so the references will come for that later. Um, and we also now have some work towards uh, constructive interpretations of hot in simplicial sets. So there are still some unsolved problems here, but, but there's definitely uh, work being done and things being accomplished there. Um, now, another direction you could be thinking of if you are thinking about constructivity of hot is maybe uh, homotopy canonicity. So this is somehow inherent to hot as a language itself rather than to some particular model. Um, and I'm not really gonna talk about that today, but I felt like I should uh, at least mention that that exists as well. Um, so again, classically, we have this concept of standard homotopy theory. Um, so you might think of topological spaces, or you might think of simplicial sets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in a precise sense, we know that these things are equivalent. They present uh, a well-behaved higher category that we call spaces, um, which satisfies properties we expect spaces to have. Um, now, the constructive picture is more complicated. So I think we're, as a community, um, still trying to figure this out. So um, I like to point to uh, an article that Mike wrote, The Derivator of Setoids, which is sort of pointing to some strange questions that come up if you want to ask, what is standard homotopy theory constructively? Um, but we could start with the question, which of those constructive interpretations that I, that I talked about in the previous slide at least classically present spaces. So if I look at them in classical mathematics, I can construct an equivalence um, to one of these standards that I already have. Maybe I don't know that that equivalence is constructive, but at least this is a place to start. Um, so which constructive interpretations classically present spaces? Uh, now we have some answers. So there are the, uh, there's the equivariant vibrations model in Cartesian cubicle sets. Um, so this is work of myself, Steve Audi, Terry Kokand, Emily Real, and Christian Settler, which uh, we've been writing up for a long time, but I can promise you that we're actually writing it up actively these days, and I hope that you will get to see it soon. Um, now there's also, uh, if you look in Cartesian cubicle sets uh, with one connection on the cubes, also, you can get a constructive interpretation that classically presents spaces. And this is uh, my work with Christian Settler. Okay. Um, and then we have the constructive simplicial set quasi interpretation. So, like I said, there's some uh, unanswered questions there in terms of interpreting hot, but in terms of it being a constructive um, a presentation of an infinity category, that, that there's no question about. Um, and these do classically present spaces. Uh, they're sort of defined in such a way that if you look at them classically, you just see standard simplicial sets. So that's more immediate. 
So this talk is not about those uh, good things, but it's about bad things. Um, this talk is about constructive interpretations that classically don't present spaces. Um, so it turns out that many of the cubicle interpretations that uh, people came up with when they started coming up with cubicle interpretations don't present spaces. Um, and this is not really, uh, I'm not really announcing new work here. So uh, you may have heard about it before if you follow along with these things. Um, so the ideas that I'm going to present in this talk uh, were sketched in Christian's talk in 2018 to cubicle models of type theory, also model homotopy types. And a bit of the argument that I'm going to go through appears in a slightly different form in uh, a note that Thierry posted to the homotopy type theory Google group in 2018. Um, so this, people have generally had a sense that this is true, um, but they might not be aware of the whole argument. Um, so that was the situation that I was in. I had a vague sense of, of what was going on here, but I didn't really understand it. And so now that I'm here with Christian, I started talking to him about it. Um, and oh, the way things started was in this, we're writing up this equivariant vibrations paper. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we put a note in here where we explain this counterexample? So I started typing up this uh, little paragraph and the paragraph got longer and longer. And um, now we're essentially writing a paper. So uh, that's uh, where I am right now. I, tried uh, very hard and uh, run up to this talk to complete writing up the paper, but it's still a ways to go. So unfortunately I can't uh, prove what I'm going to say and you shouldn't believe me until later, um, but I hope it won't be too long. Um, and in the process of writing it up, we've thought of some new things and cleaned it up a bit. So uh, some benefit from that. Okay, but why care? You can sort of understand why nobody wrote a paper about this before, because it's a sort of negative result. Uh, we're really interested in the good models. Um, but I think it's it's good to have it out in the open. Um, for one thing, it motivates this uh, equivariant vibration fix that you can do in Cartesian cubicle sets. Um, and I hope that it can give some indication towards uh, a characterization of these model structures that aren't spaces. So, I mean, even though they're not spaces, they might be something interesting. And um, in working through these counterexamples, I've seen some things that I think uh, indicate uh, how we could do that. So uh, we'll see about that. Um, and also while, while working through this, we see some general tools for comparing things with spaces. Uh, how do I show that something can't be equivalent in some way to standard homotopy theory? So I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so. I'm going to start with reviewing the, some particular emphases, uh, how we interpret homotopy type theory in cubicle sets. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, invariance of model categories. So model categories are the uh, presentations of higher categories that we interpret hot as generally, and um, which we'll be, we'll be working with uh, here. And then I'll get on to the sort of concrete counterexamples. Okay, so let's start with interpreting homotopy type theory in cubicle sets. And cubicle sets here are gonna be presheaves on something I'll call a cube category, which I mean, I'm, I won't define precisely what things do and do not count as cube categories, but uh, there's some sort of uh, category where we want to think of the objects as cubes and morphisms as maps between cubes. Um, so a cubicle set maybe looks like this. I've got some points in it, I've got some lines, I've got some squares, maybe I've got a cube here. Can't really tell if it's filled in, maybe it is. And they're glued together in some way. Uh, and the choice of my cube category determines what structure is inherent in a cube. So is it the case that every square I draw in the cubicle set has a, a diagonal that goes from the bottom to the top or even in the other direction? Um, or if I look at an edge, I've sort of drawn them in an undirected way, but in general, they're directed. And then I can ask, well, for every edge in one direction, is there a matching edge that goes in the other direction? Okay. Um, and so by, by changing those parameters, I get cubicle sets that look different, right? Um, so the starting point for all of this work and what kind of inspired the cubicle interpretations of homotopy type theory 
is some work of Daniel Kahn back in 1955. And he was doing homotopy theory with um, what I'll call the minimal cube category. So later he switched to working with simplices, but for a bit he was looking at cubes. And so the objects of this cube category look like uh, monoidal products of an interval object. So if I take an interval, I take n many copies of it, that's an n cube. Think of these as a bunch of coordinates. And every n cube has two faces along each axis. So if I have a, a square, I could project out the top and bottom faces. That's the vertical axis. Or I could project out the left and right faces from the horizontal axis. Um, so four faces on the two cube, more faces on the three cube, et cetera. And so I can, I can think of these maps as sticking in a zero or a one in one of the coordinates. So here I go from the two cube to the three cube and the two cube to the three cube again. Okay. Um, and also every n cube can be seen as a degenerate n plus one cube. And this corresponds to maps which delete a coordinate from my cube. So I can uh, forget and project down from a higher cube to a lower cube. OK. So those are the morphisms in my cube category, or rather, they're, they're generated by these under composition and some equations. And that's all we have. Um, and so those are cubicle sets. But not every cubicle set really counts as a space. The cubicle sets that encode spaces have to have this extra property, which I'm going to call box filling. I think he calls them like E complexes or something. Um, I don't remember now. I think there's an E in it. Uh, so what does box filling mean? It means that in my cubicle set, every open box I can find should be filled by a cube. So an open box maybe looks something like this. I have a square, but I've, I'm missing one of the faces and I'm missing the inside. That's the general form of an open box. And so if I find one of these in my cubicle set, then there had better be uh, a square filling in that open box. And I've drawn the square in a kind of squashed way. So you can see I've added uh, an extra path and I've added some kind of surface, but I've, I've squeezed it in. And this is like the topological intuition you want to have. Um, so it's not that whenever I see this, there's a, a square that looks like this, but that um, there's sort of uh, right on top of these three lines, a single line, which represents their concatenation. And so this corresponds to the fact that in topological spaces, say, uh, um, whenever I have a bunch of, of paths, I can compose them and get a single path that, that goes the whole way. So here I've got three paths, and I'm composing to get a path that goes the whole way. And the nice thing about this box filling is that it generalizes nicely into higher dimensions. Um, so here I'm just looking at the two-dimensional square case, but it turns out that the, the higher versions of these things are also the right properties you want to have. OK, so what does an open box in general look like? Well, we can form them in this nice way. So start from the boundary of a cube. Um, so say, here's my one cube, the line, and its boundary consists of two points. Then I stretch out everything in a new direction. So here my two points have turned into two lines. And my one cube at the bottom has turned into a two cube. And now, uh, either on the top or the bottom, I add a cap. So that's a copy of this one cube from my original uh, boundary. So a copy of the codomain here comes and sits on the domain. And so now I've got an open box. Um, and I can stretch in whatever direction I want. Um, so this, I think, is the way that Kahn formulates it. Um, an equivalent way to formulate it, at least in Kahn setting, and this is the one that we're going to use when we switch to different cubes, uh, is a little more of a general picture. So rather than starting from the boundary of a cube, we're going to start from an arbitrary subobject of some cubicle set. So now this isn't a, a cube on the bottom, it's just some cubicle set, and I've picked a couple of points I could pick more or less things if I want. I've just chosen a couple of points. And then again, I stretch everything in a new direction. So now my two points become two lines and my uh, weird little bendy thing becomes a cylinder of sorts. And now I'm gonna add the cap, but instead of uh, asking that it be specifically on the top or the bottom, I say you can put it in the middle if you want. 
Uh, and here I'm being sort of vague. This doesn't really make sense the way I'm saying it, but um, it's, it doesn't pay to be precise about it really. So I'm gonna be imprecise about it and say. So one can show that, I mean, uh, the open boxes you get are different, but one can show that uh, cubicle sets with box filling against these first version of boxes and cubicle sets with box filling against the second version uh, are the same. You can build up these weirder open box fillings using the, the standard ones. Okay. Um, so that's in those minimal cubicle sets. Now to model hot constructively, we actually want more structured cube categories. So with more morphisms than the ones that um, we have in minimal uh, cubes. Now, why is that the case? That's something that I don't really want to get into. So I hope you'll take it for granted. Um, but going and looking at the historical record, we start with this uh, bayesian kokan huber uh, model of homotopy type theory and cubicle sets. So the this one in 2013 is doing most of it. And then in 2019 covers the univalence axiom, which is really the important bit. Um, so this is in affine cubicle sets, which is what I call it. And I, I don't know if anyone else likes the name, but I keep using it. Um, and here we have everything that we had in the minimal cube category, but we also are able to permute axes. So there's a morphism from the two cube to itself that flips it uh, by flipping the axes. So you have to think about these as being directed. Um, there's two axes and I can rotate them. Okay. Uh, so that was the first start. This model turned out to be a little problematic for higher inductive types. Um, so in this next paper, going Kokan, Huber, and Wartberg, um, which got published in 2015, um, or came out in 2015, I guess, um, they really uh, went all the way with adding structure to the cube category. So first of all, um, this is a Cartesian cube category, meaning that the um, this monoidal product is actually a Cartesian product. So not only is it symmetric, but uh, also it has a diagonal. So there's a map from the one cube to the two cube that includes um, the diagonal. And they also added these connections. And so these I like to think about um, kind of geometrically as, or logically as taking the minimum or maximum of two points on the interval and then producing that as a point in the interval. And this uh, negation or um, involution or reversal that sends the one on the interval to zero and the zero on the interval to one. And that turns out to simplify some things, um, but it turns out that you don't need all of that. Um, so, and Julie Favoni and Harper in 2018 did a, a computational interpretation of uh, cubicle type theory or a computational formulation of cubicle type theory. And then um, these other folks, most of whose names I've said, so I'll just say Bruneri and Lakata to finish it up, um, worked out the cubicle sets version of this. Here they use uh, a cubicle, uh, the cube category that's Cartesian. So again, you have these permutations and the diagonal, um, but they got rid of this reliance on connections and the evolution. And uh, I forgot, I put this one in parentheses because uh, even in this work, it was clear that the this reversal is not really necessary to get things working, but they were relying in a, a heavier way on the connections and it turned out that you don't need that. Okay, so now we've got this great variety of cube categories where we can interpret hot. And in all these cases, we're interpreting types by maps with this kind of box filling. Um, so uh, a type is going to be interpreted as a map of cubical sets. This one at the bottom is the interpretation of the context. This one at the top to think of as the interpretation of the type, or you could think of this map as the projection from the extended context. And in order to, to count as types, they have to have this right lifting property against box inclusion. So this is kind of a, a relativized version of being a, a cubicle set with box filling, where whenever I see an open box in my type, which sits over a filled in box in my context, then I can fill in that open box in my type. Um, and sort of the reason I went and generalized this uh, box filling a bit was so that I can say, in fact, in all cases, it works out this way. Um, so 
in some of the papers I mentioned, it's not presented exactly in this way, but one can see that it's equivalent. Okay, so we've just kind of imported this, this um, box filling with a few adjustments from Kant's work. And so another question is, is this still homotopically reasonable for these extended cube categories? Is this still uh, a reasonable notion of what makes a cubical set a space when we change what our cubical sets are? Um, so what's perhaps a bit remarkable is that we do still get um, quill and model structures on these forms of cubical set, uh, which correspond to the type theoretic models. So a quill and model structure is some kind of uh, presentation of a higher category. Um, so it describes some kind of homotopical world like spaces, but also others. Um, and so we can do this even constructively, which is uh, in itself remarkable. Um, and Christian Sattler was the one who sort of did this first for cubical sets, working from the type theoretic models, using properties of the type theoretic models to build this model structure, which is sort of a cool thing. Um, Steve Audi did this for Cartesian cubical sets. Um, so Christian did it for uh, cubical sets with connections. And um, Anders Markberg and, ah, shoot, it's Swan. It's Andrew Swan. I'm sorry, Andrew Swan. I think he's in the audience too. Uh, I always uh, get the S wrong. It's it's not because I don't like you or anything. It's just uh, something wrong with my brain. I'll fix it afterwards. Um, so we uh, we also did uh, something about that. Um, so uh, uh, what's the what goes into a Cullen model structure? So there are these two classes of maps: um, the vibrations and the co-vibrations. And in our models of type theory. Um, we are importing things from our models of type theory, the vibrations will be exactly the, the types, the things that lift against these box inclusions. And the co-vibrations will just be our uh, monomorphisms. And if you're working constructively, then they should be decidable monomorphisms. Um, and then from those two classes of maps, one gets uh, corresponding classes of maps, the trivial co-vibrations and the trivial vibrations. And these are um, deduced by uh, looking at maps that lift against co-fibrations and fibrations. So a trivial fibration is a map that has a right lifting property against co-fibrations, and a trivial co-fibration is a map that has a left lifting property against uh, fibrations. And so by construction, because the fibrations are the things that le right lift against box inclusions, the trivial co-fibrations include the box inclusions, but can also have other things that are maybe built up from many box inclusions chained together, uh, et cetera. And then from those two things, uh, we get a definition of weak equivalences. A weak equivalence is something that factors as a trivial co-fibration followed by a trivial vibration. And um, so that's uh, kind of the, the end point of model structure is to, to have some notion of weak equivalence between objects in a category. Um, so this other stuff is sort of helpful, but in some sense, the, the point of the model category is the weak equivalences. If you think about spaces, weak equivalences of spaces are um, things that induce isomorphisms on homotopy groups. So they're the homotopical notion of equivalence of things. And um, in general, a equivalent model structure is describing a notion of, uh, of homotopy-like equivalence of things. Um, so the end point of that is, well, at least we've got some kind of homotopical structure on these um, cubical set categories. We just don't know what kind of homotopical structure it is. But uh, since we have that, we can start comparing. So the, the appropriate notion of equivalence between model categories is called Quillen equivalence. And so we can try to check whether these model categories that we got are Quillen equivalent to um, standard model structures for presenting spaces like simplicial sets or topological spaces. Um, actually, we also have other model structures on cubical sets that we can use to compare directly. So out of these models of type theory, we get um, model structures on cubical sets, but we actually already had some model structures on cubical sets. Um, these are the test model structures, which uh, were um, confirmed to exist by Szynski, building on work of Grotendieck. And um, what this says is, I should have wrote any category of pre sheaves on what's called a test category has a model structure where the co-fibrations are the monomorphisms. Uh, and where you have equivalent equivalence to simplicial sets. Um, and, and so Ulrich Buchholz 
tests and Ed Morehouse 2017 showed that all these cube categories that I listed in my big list of cube categories are test categories. So they have these uh, Sosinski test model structures, um, which are presentations of spaces, standard spaces. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that, um, well, these test model structures aren't necessarily constructive, at least the way they're, they're built is uh, not constructive. Um, and we don't get a very explicit definition of what the vibrations are. So it's not very easy to compare um, with uh, these model structures that we've gotten from type theory. So let's ask ourselves, what could go wrong? So an intuition that we have for spaces is that any space is a homotopy co-limit of contractible things. Um, you can think a space is made by gluing a bunch of disks together, maybe. And uh, at least one of these, say, CW complexes, built by gluing a bunch of contractible things together. Um, and uh, so if we look at our, our Cubical sets, for example, um, any cube is going to be a, a very trivial limit of contractible things. It's going to be contractible itself. But even this is not like immediate. We have to know that, say, well, the, the terminal object is contractible by definition. And we know that the map from one to the interval is an open box inclusion. So then we have a, an equivalence to one. So the one is contractible. And then we say, oh, OK, I have another box inclusion from the one cube to the two cube. So the two cube is also contractible. And then I keep going, and I get that the three cube is contractible, and so on. Um, but what I mean to say is it's not immediate that these cubes are, are made out of just one point. I have to do some thinking about it. And it comes out of the, the structure of the cube category and the vibrations I've chosen. Now, once we start putting more structure on the cube category, we get more potentially exotic objects. Um, so for example, if I have a, a symmetry, the square flipping along the, around the diagonal, um, then I can look at the co-limit of um, that or the quotient by this flipping. So geometrically, I might imagine this looks like a triangle. I've taken the, the cube square and folded it up on itself along the diagonal. Um, if I have a reversal, then I could take a line and quotient it by identifying every uh, point with its reversal. So one gets identified with zero, uh, one fourth gets identified with three fourths, uh, as you like. Um, and once I have connections, I can I can make some freaky looking things. Uh, these actually aren't relevant to the talk. They're just uh, things that I've had to think about in my life. Um, but these first two will be relevant to the talk. Um, so the question becomes, all right, can I break these down? Are these... Um, perhaps contractible, or do they reduce somehow? Maybe one of them is actually a circle. I don't know. Um, so let's look at these. Uh, again, if I look at them geometrically, they look like they should be contractible. Uh, so I fold over the square on itself to get a triangle, or I fold over the line on itself to get a slightly smaller line. Um, and sometimes we know that they are. By sometimes, I mean in some uh, cubicle sets. So for example, if I look at this first one, if I have connections, then I can uh, contract my triangle to a point um, by this map that takes i and j and sort of lifts it up uh, over time to the uh, one. So if I plug in zero and t here, I get i, j. If I plug in one, I get one, one. Um, so at least in cubicle sets with connections, this one on the left is contractible. Um, but we'll see that it's not uh, in other settings. Um, right, so the point here is that this is a uh, invariant under permutations, this scaling. Um, and if we look at the test model structures, we actually get sometimes funny answers. So in the test model structure on Cartesian cubicle sets, this uh, I squared mod sigma is contractible. Um, but if I look in affine cubicle sets, then this thing is actually a suspension of a kz mod 2, 1. This is some fancy topological space. And uh, in De Morgan cubicle sets, this quotient of the interval by the negation is uh, the not suspended version of that. So this is um, infinite dimensional projective space, I believe. Um, OK, so uh, it's not really always obvious what they should be. Um, and it's also not obvious what they are, uh, where where we are in our type theoretic models. Okay, 
Um, so if we want to show that one of these things is in spaces, and for the purpose of this talk, that's what I want to do, uh, it's not enough to show that some particular comparison isn't an equivalent. So it's not enough to show that, say, this thing geometrically looks like it should be contractible, but isn't. And it's not enough to show that uh, we're different from the test model structure, because, I mean, we could be literally different, but there could still be uh, some equivalents out there that we haven't found. So what we're looking for, really, is some kind of property that's invariant under equivalence of model categories that is characteristic of spaces, so satisfied in spaces, maybe somewhat particular spaces, and fails in some of these cubicle sets that we're looking at. So this is the property that we're going to look at. Um, so remember, we have in a model category this concept of vibration, and a vibrant object is something is, is an object whose map to the terminal object is a vibration. So think of um, uh, maps, uh, sorry, cubicle sets with box slip filling. All right, uh, so here's the definition. Um, we are starting from a, a vibration between vibrant objects F. And um, so I'll say that this is fiber-wise trivial if whenever I pull it back to something that's uh, contractible, I get a trivial vibration. Um, so a trivial vibration being a vibration that's also a weak equivalence. So uh, a way to read this is, well, I've got this map. It might not itself uh, be an equivalence, but if I just look at what it does at a particular fiber, uh, then it should be an equivalence. So fiber over any contractible thing, but this is more or less uh, fiber over a point. Um, and so we'll say that uh, fiber-wise trivial vibrations trivialize in a model category when all of these things that are fiber-wise trivial are actually trivial vibrations. So if I want to test whether something, whether a vibration is an equivalence, I just have to look at each individual um, fiber over contractible thing. Okay. And uh, I'll also talk up very briefly, um, occasionally about this property restricted to propositional vibrations. So these are uh, vibrations where the diagonal is a weak equivalence. And you can think of, uh, so we think of vibrations as types, right? over a context. You can think of propositional vibrations as types that are propositional in the sense you're familiar with. Um, so first theorem, these two properties are invariant under quillen equivalence. And for people who are sort of immersed in the language of in infinity categories, this is not really surprising. So essentially what this is saying is that uh, if you have a, a map F and every pullback of F to a point is an isomorphism, then F is an isomorphism. And um, if you read it like that and think in your one categorical mind, then okay, this is clearly an invariant of, of categories of two equivalents. Um, and the, the propositional case corresponds to only asking this for um, monomorphisms F. So this is the, the invariant I'm gonna talk about today. In the paper, we also look at uh, the excluded middle as an invariant of model categories, but I'm not gonna talk about this today. Um, so all this stuff about things being vibrations and being vibrant objects is just sort of setting it up so this pullback uh, in the model category corresponds to an infinity categorical pullback. Um, okay, so how about simplicial sets? Suppose F is a, a fiber-wise trivial map, and I want to show that it's a trivial vibration. So my, my claim is that um, this property FT, FT is satisfied in spaces. So we can look at some special sets. Um, so I'll start with a, a fiber-wise trivial map F. And to check that it's a trivial vibration, I have to show that it lifts against these boundary inclusions of, of simplices. So this is definition of, of uh, trivial vibration in simplicial sets. And so what I can do is uh, form a little pullback in the middle of this diagram. Um, so maybe just forget about, I'm doing a little vibrant replacement here, but it's not really important. Just think that, well, I can pull back uh, X, or I can pull back this vibration so that it sits over the same thing I'm, I'm lifting against, this N simplex. And then I have uh, uh, the fiber over that. And then to solve this original lifting problems, it's equivalent to fill in a diagonal here on the left square. Um, so once I have one of those, I just compose with this. Uh, and then I have a lift for the whole square. OK, so now if I'm focused on the, the thing on the left, well, this is a pullback of f to some trivial thing. 
um, the n simplex is contractible. And so now because f is fiber wise trivial, I have a, a fill in. Um, so this is trivial vibration by definition that's against these. And so uh, any fiber wise trivial vibration in simplicial sets is um, trivial. And you can apply this in, in other cases where you have particularly nice generating co vibrations. So simplicial sets and anything equivalent to simplicial sets has this uh, property fiber wise trivial vibrations trivialize. And um, this isn't actually even restricted to the classical story. So if you look at the constructive simplicial set model structures, um, of Simon Henry and uh, Gambino, Settler, and Smilo, who do uh, alternative construction of the same model structure, um, the trivial vibrations are still defined by right lifting against um, uh, boundary inclusions, although it, some things turn out differently. Uh, so you can still do this argument and um, get this constructively. And uh, another way we could get some intuition for what this condition is like is by looking at discrete model categories. So if I have any uh, complete and co-complete um, one category, I can see it as a model category where the weak equivalences are the isomorphisms. So things are equivalent just when they're isomorphic. And the vibrations and the co-vibrations are just any map. Um, and so in that case, uh, these two versions of the condition, the one just for propositional vibrations and the one for all vibrations coincide. And they're also equivalent to this more familiar condition that the global sections functor is conservative. So if um, you give me some map and it's an isomorphism on points, then it's actually an isomorphism. Uh, so one also calls this one is a generator or a strong generator. Um, people use different terminology for it. Uh, but a one topos where this holds and where the initial and terminal object are distinct from each other is called well-pointed. Uh, and this is a pretty narrow condition. So uh, there are maybe other well-pointed elementary topoi, but any well-pointed growth in D topos is just set. Um, so this is, we might expect a very characteristic of spaces since spaces are the infinity version of sets. Um, and so we have some other examples that, that indeed look sort of set-like or space-like. So if we uh, take the simplicial set uh, model structure for spaces and truncate it, um, then we get something that satisfies this condition. In particular, if we take zeros truncated simplicial sets, we have something um, which is essentially sets, more or less. Um, but there are also some exotic examples. So uh, these are ones that uh, we weren't expecting uh, when we started thinking about this, but sort of discovered along the way. So the infinity topos of parameterized spectra, um, so this is a space with a kind of bundle of spectra over it, has this property. And this um, presents a Grotendieck infinity topos. So there are Grotendieck infinity topoi that are not spaces, but still have this property. Uh, another exotic example, this one isn't an infinity topos, but if you take the product of set or spaces or something like that with the category of spectra, uh, you get something that has the propositional version of this condition, but not the unrestricted version. Uh, and I don't know whether there's an infinity topos example. So if this is something you like to think about, think about it for me. Um, right, so uh, this is maybe not in the infinity toposic case, uh, the right generalization of well-pointedness, or at least it's something weaker and sort of points to maybe that concept being more subtle in the infinity case. So that's kind of tangential to the uh, whole point of this talk, but I think it's kind of interesting. So I wanted to mention it. Okay, um, so that's nice. In the examples that we're gonna look at, uh, it will be convenient to use a different characterization of this. And so this characterization makes sense in model categories where we have some well-behaved uh, propositional truncation. So I'm going to say that a uh, co-fibration is squash if it left lifts against propositional vibrations. So you should think of these things as being like the map from a, a type into its propositional truncation. Um, in particular, it sort of doesn't add new points. It just adds identifications between things. And of course, the propositional truncation uh, map adds all identifications, but a squash might just add some in general. Um, so we'll say that a model category with pullback stable co-fibrations, this is just kind of to make the concept sane, has a stable propositional truncation when, uh, whenever I have a map with a fibrant codomain, 
I have a factorization of that map as a squash followed by propositional vibration. So essentially this is saying if I have a map, I can kind of turn it into a type and take its propositional truncation simultaneously. Um, so if I just sort of wanted to interpret propositional truncation, I might assume that what I'm starting with is a vibration, but I don't need to here. Uh, and then this is the, the map from the type to its propositional truncation, if you like. And um, squash maps with fiber and codomain are preserved by pullback along vibrations. Um, so this sort of makes this whole factorization stable under pullback along vibrations. And restricting to vibrations here is just to make things sensible, but you don't have to really think about it. Just think stable under pullback. Uh, and again, if we go to discrete model categories um, to get some intuition about what I'm saying here, then what I'm asking them for are just pullback stable images. The squash maps will be, um, I guess, regular epimorphisms in this case. You've got a regular category, and the, the propositional vibrations are monomorphisms. So the epimono factorization, and it's stable under pullback. OK. So if I'm in the setting where I have stable propositional truncations, then um, the monomorphism, the, the restricted version of this condition, is equivalent to this other condition, um, that every fiber-wise squash cofibration is squash. Um, so again, it's about fiber-wise properties determining global properties. Uh, but now I'm taking a cofibration. And if I know that every uh, pullback along a vibration to a trivial thing is squash, then the map itself should be squash. And this is the characterization that I'm going to uh, refute in our examples. And so I'm, I'm refuting the weaker version of this condition, so it's also going to, to refute the stronger version. OK, so now that we've set up our invariant we want to refute, let's get to doing it. Um, so for concreteness, I'm not going to do this stuff in generality. I'm just going to look at Cartesian cubes. So remember, this is uh, cubes where I have faces and degeneracies and where the, the product is Cartesian. Um, so this is nice and easy to think about, I think. And our candidate pathological object is this quotient of the square by its um, flipping around the diagonal. So this triangle looking thing. And what we're going to show is that uh, the Morally, uh, the inclusion of the, the points of this thing into it. So I've drawn this little swirly in it. So you know it's not a regular triangle, but a strange triangle. Um, is a map that's fiber-wise squash, but not squash. Uh, so in order for this to make sense, I need to do a little fiber replacement here at the end. So this is uh, like this quotient itself is not a, um, a uh, an object with box filling, a con complex, if you like. So uh, it's not really meaningful to talk about this map itself, but if I just uh, fill in all the open boxes, then I get something where it does make sense. Okay. So the intuition here is that when I have a fiber-wise squash map, I'm not allowed to add points. Again, think propositional truncation. I don't add any points. Um, but real squash maps not only can't add points, but can't add um, weird triangles. So this is a map that adds a weird triangle without adding any points. So it's going to be our problem guy. OK, so the first half of this is to show that this is fiber Y squash. And um, for that, it turns out to suffice that it's subjective on points, which is the intuition that I was giving. And um, I don't really want to talk about how to prove this, because it's a bit finicky and, and not really enlightening. Um, and it has to do with specifics of cubicle sets that if I have a point in this fiber replacement, then I can kind of draw a line back to this. Uh, pre-fiber replacement object. Um, but anyway, if we instantiate this lemma with our candidate map, then we get that it is indeed fiber-wise squash. Okay. So now onto the second half where we want to prove it's not uh, genuinely squash. And so the idea here, um, well, again, like fiber-wise squashing, squashing doesn't add new points that are isolated. It's just allowed to identify things, not add new things. And so you can capture it with this uh, lemma here. So if I have a, a, a map that factors through some component of a coproduct, then the other half has to be empty. So I can't throw in some extra things on the side in the squash map. And But we want to show that uh, squashing not only doesn't add points, but doesn't add um, weird swirly triangles. So the strategy we're going to use is to show that 
the internal HOM from this object preserves squash coke vibrations. So let me kind of spell out why this is what we want. So what we're saying is that if A into B is squashing, then the map from pictures of this object in A to pictures of this object in B is also squashing. So the points in here are um, pictures of a weird triangle in here. So when I say that this is squash, I'm saying you can't add any new swirly triangles in this original map. OK. So is, is that the internal hum in cubicle sets, the square brackets? Yes. Yes, yep. that's the internal hum. Um, so uh, this is sort of specific to the Cartesian situation in that if I were in affine cubicle sets, I would want the monoidal hum. Uh, but let's not worry about it. OK, so what I want to show is that this preserves squash co vibrations. And I can use a more concrete description of squashing that I have in cubicle sets. So I said I'm this makes sense in model categories where I have propositional truncations. And I highlighted the fact that I do have propositional truncations in these cubicle sets. But let's uh, remember how that works. Um, so being a vibration is generated by open box inclusions. If then I want to look at propositional vibrations, uh, then I also have lifting against boundary inclusions. Um, so remember, squashing is left lifting with respect to propositional vibrations. And um, propositional vibrations are right lifting with respect to these. So these, um, you say, generate the, the squash co vibrations. And so the, what these two things look like, well, uh, we talked about how we make an open box starting with a, a boundary, or not necessarily a boundary, but a subobject. So that I stretch things out in a new dimension and add a, a copy of the codomain somewhere in the middle. And uh, so that would be the open box inclusions. And then the boundary inclusions are where I do the same thing in the first two steps, but instead of adding one copy in the middle somewhere, I add one on the top and one on the bottom. Um, so a propositional vibration is something that right lifts against these, and a, a squash is, in some sense, generated by mass of this form. Uh, and in some sense, the sense that I'm going to use is uh, given to us by the small object argument, a scary argument. Um, and this tells us that every squash co-fibration can be built up in a certain way. Um, so there are several steps, several scary steps. And this is also um, this uh, decomposition of squash co-fibrations is classical. So this is the part of the argument where, where I'm actually using classical logic, so you know. Um, but the way to, to read this is um, that every squash co-fibration is made of a series of steps where in each step we add a filler for an open box. So in, in a simple open box inclusion, it's one step. We have an open box, and we uh, put in a filler for it. But so that's the, the bottom one here, the generating squash co vibrations. Then pushouts of that means that I can not just uh, put in a filler for a standalone open box, but if I see an open box in a space, I can put in a filler for it. Uh, composites means that I can do this repeatedly many times, so I can fill as many open boxes as I want, and then uh, don't worry about the retract. Okay, so now I'm going to use this to break down showing that this preserves squash co vibrations to showing that it preserves each of these ingredients. Okay, so here are my ingredients. Now, uh, any functor is going to preserve uh, retracts, so that's no problem. Um, for transfinite composites, well, this is a kind of colimit. And if I look just at the unquotient um, to 2 cube, then that uh, preserves all colimits. So one says that this is a tiny object or internally tiny object, um, essentially because by definition, a, um, a, a 2 cube in a colimit is a 2 cube in one of the, the things in the colimit. Um, and so we can use some general theory of um, things that preserve co-limits to see that uh, this um, quotient also preserves composites. So you know, these are, um, one can use uh, different, there are like various things you could use closure of under to, to get to this. Let's just say compact objects are closed under finite co-limits. So this um, quotient is a finite co-limit of uh, I squared and a loop to itself. So um, uh, this 
internal hum from the quotient also preserves uh, these composites. And in fact, you can, okay, so this is be preserved. And in fact, you can do something similar um, for the pushouts. So it's not necessarily the case that this quotient preserves all pushouts, like the map from the, the square does. Um, but in fact, it preserves pushouts along monomorphisms. And those are the, the ones that we're interested here. So it's um, because this is a co-limit indexed by a finite monoid. Um, I don't know if this is somewhere in the literature, but we proved it for ourselves. So this one's more interesting, but it's also preserved. And um, thanks to these properties and some other things, if we want to check for the, the generating squash co vibrations, it turns out all we need to know is that the um, internal hum into the interval is contractible. And if we look at what that internal hum is, well, here I'm just looking at the zero cells, but uh, if we look at it. Um, in the zero cells, the objects of this, or sorry, the elements of this are going to be maps from the square to the um, line, which are invariant under permuting the, the indices in the argument. Um, so for example, the constant zero is uh, invariant under the permutations, constant one is, um, but if I try and use either of these, I project that one component, then that's not gonna be um, invariant under flipping. Flipping will turn one into the other. So those don't count. Um, and if we look at the higher cells, uh, we see kind of the same picture. The only things uh, in here are constant maps. Um, so the collection of maps from I squared mod sigma to I is the same as just I itself. It's the interval and that's contractible. Um, and so the effect here, why does this tell us that, uh, that this preserves uh, generating squash coke vibrations? Well, if I have um, uh, one of these generating things and I have a picture of my weird triangle in the, the bottom, then this, uh, this map has to be constant in the kind of new coordinate here. So everything is um, stretched out in a new dimension, but because there aren't any interesting maps from the triangle to I, it has to sort of sit in one slice of this cylinder. And if it's a, just sitting at one slice in the cylinder, then it's kind of homotopic to one that's sitting in the particular slice that I've already put in. And so up to a homotopy, it's already sitting up here at the top. So I'm not really allowed to introduce any uh, weird triangles in one of these maps. Okay. So at the end of the day, after doing going through that argument, I conclude that the internal hum out of this weird triangle um, preserves squash co vibrations. And now, so recalling what I did before, I know that this inclusion of the points into the weird triangle is Barbara Y squash. And now if I want to show that it's not squash for real, um, it's enough to show that after I apply this internal hum, it's not squash. Okay, so now I'm here. And um, it turns out actually using also this small object argument stuff, but with trivial co-vibrations instead of squash co-vibrations that I can um, replace this internal hum into a vibrant replacement. It's a vibrant replacement of the internal hum. So I can actually just look really at this internal hum on its own. Um, so I'm comparing this hum space to this hum space. And now the maps from uh, the, the weird triangle into this set of three points are just gonna be constant. You have to send it to one of the three points. Um, but what are the maps from the weird triangle to itself? Well, of course, there are the constant maps again, and there's also the identity map, and that's it. Uh, if I look now at the higher cells, so uh, an n cell in this mapping space will be a map from the n cube product with this thing to itself, then the picture looks exactly the same. You have the constant maps, you have the identity map, and that's it. So what this is telling us is that none of these constant maps are homotopic to the identity at all. This identity is kind of an isolated point in this mapping space, um, right? So this actually turns out to be the sum of the collection of constant maps and the identity map. And that identity map is a point that's outside the image of this um, three points. So this tells us that it's not squash. It adds a new isolated 
point. It adds this triangle, which was the intuition we had the whole time. Uh, so here's our map that's fiber-wise squash, but not squash. So this means that the Cartesian box filling model structure fails. Uh, fiber-wise trivial fibrations trivialize. Um, actually fails the restricted monomorphism version of it even, and that it's not presenting spaces. Okay, pretty good. So take a moment to relax before we jump back up and um, go back to the big picture. All right, so I was looking at Cartesian cubicle sets there, and um, this version of the argument where you look at this uh, weird triangle works with Cartesian cubicle sets, and it also works with affine cubicle sets. So if you take out the diagonal, it didn't come up at all, and it doesn't uh, matter. Um, but it doesn't work with connections. So if you have a cube category with connections, this argument stops working. Um, essentially, the, the identity map in this mapping space from the weird triangle to itself isn't isolated anymore. It's, in fact, homotopic to a constant map, because you have uh, this homotopy that I flashed up before, actually. Um, essentially, you can you can scale up uh, both of these um, outputs of the identity up to constants, and you can do this in a way that's invariant under the permutations. Right, you're scaling it up uh, in both coordinates at the same rate according to this kind of time variable, I guess. Um, now, if you have this uh, reversal operator, so that you can look at the the quotient of the the line by its flipping. Then you can use that quotient to play out uh, essentially the same argument, just with this replaced, in these cubicle sets that have that flipping. Um, so that includes De Morgan cubicle sets, Boolean cubicle sets. I think cleaning cubicle sets is also a variation you can, where you just kind of change what equations hold, but where you have connections and negation. So this is uh, this works even though these have connections. You just have to look at something else. Um, if you wanted to then eliminate this counterexample, I guess you would need something that kind of contracts the line to a midpoint in a way that's invariant under that, that flipping. OK, um, not much time left, but OK. Uh, so at the end of the day, what do we, we know? So we covered the affine and Cartesian and De Morgan examples uh, with different counterexamples. Um, I mentioned. At the beginning, that uh, Christian and I came up with this um, semi lattice thing where you have one connection and not the others. And this one actually uh, does present uh, spaces. And then there's this one with two connections and nothing else, and or well, two connections and Cartesian structure and nothing else. And, and nobody knows about this. It has a lot of strange, you can make a lot of strange objects uh, out of the cubes. And uh, it's very ill behaved, but. It's ill-behaved in a way that it's difficult to work with it, not in a way that we know that there's something wrong with it. So we're stuck there. Oh, well. Um, and so that's for these naive box filling model structures. But you can, uh, as I said, in the Cartesian case, you can change the definition of open boxes to make it more complicated in such a way that these quotients of cubes, so in particular the weird triangle, but more generally quotients of cubes by automorphism groups become contractible. So um, this idea was inspired by these counterexamples and, and does indeed fix it. OK. So it's nice that at least most of these uh, are filled in. OK. Um, so I'm out of time, so I'll just close up. Uh, so what I talked about here, as I made the little warning sign, I used the small object argument, which is um, uh, at least this decomposition part of it is classical. So this is not a constructive proof. Uh, Christian, once we started talking about this again, found a, a way to explicitly construct um, examples of fiber-wise trivial propositional vibrations that, that aren't trivial vibrations. Um, I don't have as nice of a story to tell about this one as I do about the kind of original argument. So I didn't talk about it at the time anyway. Um, but when the paper comes out, then you'll be able to read it. Um, and how about hinting towards characterizing these model structures? I said in the beginning that this was a motivation. Um, at least for the Cartesian cubicle sets, I think I have an idea. So I have been talking to um, Tim Hosgood, someone I know uh, about this for a while. We haven't really talked about it recently. And, um, but recently, Reed Barton, who I think is, is watching, um, 
started talking to me about this also, and so maybe something will come of it. Um, essentially, we think that the, um, the model structure on Cartesian cubicle sets is some kind of pre-sheaf category where the, uh, the base category is made up of these weird quotients. Um, so the, the stuff that we do in the small object argument sort of shows that these, um, uh, these cube quotients are generator-like. Um, but okay, I shouldn't say too much about this. It's very much up in the air. Okay, and the Cartesian one is easier because we have something concrete we can compare to that we know is correct on the, the equivariant model structure. The others I know less. Um, and the last thing, which I recently occurred to me to wonder about, and suddenly I realized maybe it's not so clear. Um, so the, we have these equivariant and one connection model structures that classically are equivalent to spaces, but do they actually validate this uh, space-like property constructively? And we're kind of doubtful that it holds. So in simplicial sets, in the, in the constructive simplicial model, you know that trivial vibrations are still generated by boundary inclusions. But that's not the case in these cubical model structures. Um, so this is related to um, this restriction in the simplicial set models to um, uh, co-fibrations with decidable degeneracies, or sorry, monomorphisms with decidable degeneracies that you don't do in the cubical case. So we're kind of doubtful about that. And it would be sort of sad for us cubists, but I have to admit, I'm a little skeptical. And so is Christian. OK, uh, but now I, I've really run over, so I'll close it out. Um, Thank you so much. Hey, thanks very much. So we'll do our usual silent applause. And I'll open the floor to questions. Please just go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. I'll get the ball rolling. Um, so one thing that sometimes happens in cubicle in cubicle sets is you get some strange behavior for the Cartesian product uh, for, for certain cube categories where the Cartesian product of cubes isn't contractible. Um, does that come up in, in any of these non-Cartesian models in, in this story? Um, no. <laughs> So I, I mean, I haven't thought about it exactly. So um, what's true is in the, right, so in the, in the test model structure on affine cubicle sets, I think the, the Cartesian product of two one cubes is not contractible. That's yeah, that sounds thing. right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only uh, one without a Cartesian product that we really look at. Um, and I'm not sure about, or I mean, I, I've never thought about what it looks like in the um, type theoretic model structure, whether it's the same or different. Um, so it's something to think about. Yeah. It's interesting how involved this argument is. Like, it, it, I would sort of naively think that, okay, there'll just be some concrete thing you can see that that makes it look different from spaces. and. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just why I mentioned Cartesian products, just because they're elementary. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it's a remarkable argument. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, maybe this uh, more concrete version will, uh, I don't know, be more clear. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are some steps you could skip in a way. Um, so like if you just wanted to show that the um, weird triangle is not contractible, then that's a little bit simpler than um, exhibiting this non-squash fiber-wise squash map, right? Um, but it operates basically according to the same thing. Like you would still go through this small object argument. It's just some of the steps at the end are simpler. So yeah. But that, that isn't so obvious to me that you would expect it to be contractible. I mean, if you're taking a homotopy co-element, you you certainly wouldn't expect it to be contractible, right? Um, if, if you mm -hmm. have a two-element group acting on a contractible space, you'd expect the homotopy co-element to be RP infinity. So, mm -hmm. 
So that's not a homotopy invariant statement that I could see getting a counterexample. Mm, yeah. Other questions? Okay, I've got a couple more. <laughs> um, so the, uh, these these models are, do they all present infinity topoi? Um, it may be that the answer is obvious, but I haven't thought about it. Okay. Um, and then thinking about infinity topoi, is, so you mentioned this characterization of of the one topos of sets as being a well, you know, the only well pointed one topos, one is different from zero. Um, the N lab used to have a claim that uh, spaces was the only infinity topos that was well pointed. Um, yeah, there's some kind of sketch of an argument uh, in the article. I've looked at it yeah. many times, so I know. I um, just looked at it today and uh, it's been updated. It doesn't seem to quite say that anymore. Okay, um, it wasn't my fault. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it may be that this is true if you phrase it the right way. So um, it takes so long to go back. Uh, but I mean, this version, uh, this this thing which becomes well-pointedness in one topoi is not uh, like the only way you could define well-pointed for infinity topoi. So you could say, um, like, I want the infinity hum from the point uh, to to be conservative. Um, so, I mean, uh, in that case, I think you get a more restrictive condition. I gave up on finding what I was looking for, but... Um, so, like, take this literally and translate it into infinity categorical language, and I think you get a stricter condition. So, uh, in particular, like, um, spectra alone, not an infinity topos, but they have this property. Uh, and that's because um, a map of spectra is an equivalence if its homotopy fiber is contractible. You have one fiber, and um, that's all you need to look at. So things, uh, equivalences are determined fiber-wise in this sense. But uh, if you look at this, well, this is going to send anything to an equivalence because there's only one point in any spectra uh, spectrum. So this will not be conservative. So this is kind of a, a stronger thing and maybe is closer to what what one wants from well-pointedness. But it, I mean, it depends on what you want, of course. And the last thing I'll ask, since we're on this slide, like the definition of FTFT, you pulled back to a contractible, an arbitrary contractible type. Mm -hmm. Do you need to do that? You can't just pull back over the point? Um, yeah, uh, so in general, you want to pull back to a cofibrin replacement of the point, uh, but that's enough to check. Um, so I don't know, maybe that's a more intuitive way to put it, but I just did it this way. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah, actually, maybe the reason I did it this way is um, in the paper, we state this uh, definition in the more general context of uh, vibration categories. Mm. And so there you don't have a notion of cofibrant object, so you can't in general uh, mm -hmm. phrase it that way. All right. Hey, anyone else? Okay, well, let's thank Evan again. And the next talk is in two weeks, and it's me. So I hope to see you then. <laughs>